siphoning U.S. innovation by luring talents from America's top nuclear lab. A new report highlighting how Beijing uses American technology to advance its own military. Zooming in on China's real estate slump, thousands of home buyers living in unfinished buildings without electricity, running water or sewage systems. But I didn't expect the building to be rotten. A 90-year-old cardinal stands trial in Hong Kong. The case linked to humanitarian aid he offered the city's pro-democracy movement in 2019. The U.S. is selling arms to Taiwan, but not delivering them. Two lawmakers are pushing for a solution to the delays. And Vice President Kamala Harris is in Japan. We look at the top goals on her schedule. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Beijing has been siphoning talents from America's top nuclear lab based on a new report. What's more, it points out over 160 scientists that have returned to China after spending time in the U.S. lab. They've reportedly helped the regime advance in key military technologies like hypersonics and warheads. The lab that's been targeted is called the Los Alamos National Laboratory, located in New Mexico. It's home to multiple nuclear defense facilities. It developed America's first atomic bomb. Allegedly, the Chinese regime has been systematically luring Chinese talents from that lab back to China. So many of them have returned to work for China that they've been nicknamed the Los Alamos Club. That's according to an intelligence report by Strider Technologies. Beijing's effort appears successful. Since the 1980s, over 160 scientists that worked at the lab returned to China to support defense research back home. Here's a list of technologies they helped bring back. Hypersonics, deep earth penetrating warheads, unmanned autonomous vehicles, jet engines, and submarine noise reduction. Crucial to Beijing's recruitment effort is Dr. Chen Shiyi. During his 18-year tenure at the U.S. lab, Chen received over $19 million in U.S. government funding for sensitive research. He then went back to China and helped recruit many Los Alamos alumni. But the Los Alamos case is just the tip of the iceberg. Over the past decade, Beijing has been systematically luring talent to bring U.S. know-how back to China. They do it through a project called the Thousand Talents Program. Under it, the regime tempts top scholars to hand over their knowledge to China with lucrative offers. What's more, it doesn't always ask those scientists to go to China. They're often allowed to stay in their positions overseas, as long as they hand over the expertise or patents that the regime wants. Next, we zoom in on real estate in China. Thousands of home buyers are suffering from the country's deep real estate slump, living in unfinished structures known as rotten tail buildings. They usually have no electricity, no running water, elevators that don't work, and no sewage systems. And it is cost Temenis has the story. For the last six months, home for Ms. Xu has been a room with only a mosquito net covered bed, some necessities and empty bottles strewn across the floor. She lives in a high-rise apartment that she bought around three years ago in the southwestern Chinese city of Guilin. Originally attracted to the property by brochures that spoke of its waterfront views and the city's clean air. Now, however, her living conditions are far from those promises. Unpainted walls, holes where electric sockets should be, and no gas or running water. Every day she climbs up and down several flights of stairs, carrying heavy water bottles filled with a hose outside. Since there is no hot water, no water and no electricity, we wait until after water from the hose has warmed up by the sun, then we wash our hair. Chu bought her two-bedroom apartment in early 2019 for around $60,000, just about a year after its developer started construction. In June 2020, the same real estate hit the headlines after a court accused its parent company of illegal fundraising. It seized $48 million worth of its properties, including a number of flats where Xu lives. She found out a month after the construction stopped describing her feelings at the time as crashing from paradise. 
All the family's efforts were invested in this house, but I didn't expect the building to be rotten. She said her son and her husband, who live far away in the northern province of Hebei, blame her for their financial predicament and no longer speak to her. She has nowhere to go but her unfinished apartment and hopes the Guilin government will step in to help her predicament. Xu and about 20 other buyers living in the Xiulian County complex now share a makeshift outdoor toilet and gather during the day at a table and benches in the central courtyard area. They are part of a movement of home buyers around China who have moved into what they call rotting apartments. Some with hope to pressure developers and authorities to complete them, some out of financial necessity. Since the debt crisis erupted in 2021, thousands more home buyers have been caught in similar predicaments as cash strapped developers went into bankruptcy or abandoned struggling projects. In late June, Thousands of home buyers in at least 100 cities threatened to hold mortgage payments to protest stalled construction. Pre-sales have become standard practice in China. In 2021, 87% of new homes in the country were sold while still under construction. A 90-year-old Catholic cardinal stood trial in Hong Kong on Monday. Five others are facing charges with him. They are accused of what authorities describe as failure to register a humanitarian relief fund. It was set up to pay medical and legal fees for those arrested in the 2019 protests. Cardinal Joseph Zen is a retired bishop and a longtime supporter of human rights in Hong Kong. He was first arrested in May with other trustees of the fund, including singer Denise Ho. They were arrested on suspicion of colluding with foreign forces to endanger China's national security. The phrase colluding with foreign forces is a common allegation used by the Chinese communist regime to clamp down on people who don't align with its policies. The case will mainly center around whether the fund is considered an organization that is required to register and when the fund was established. All have pleaded not guilty. If convicted, they face a fine of around $1,200 with no jail time. Hong Kong is ending mandatory quarantine requirements for travelers. The policy was in place for nearly three years and forced anyone coming from overseas to isolate inside hotels. The change sounds like good news for globetrotters, but how curbed are the restrictions really? NDD's Chenny Wu has the details. Hong Kong is lifting travel restrictions, at least some of them. From Monday, the city no longer requires arriving travelers to quarantine in designated hotels. I've been waiting for this for almost three years. I've done quarantine before in a hotel, which wasn't great. So I changed my tickets today to come home a day early to get here on the first day of no quarantine. So I'm really pleased. The city's leader, John Lee, announced last week that travelers are permitted to stay in a home or hotel of their choice, but have to self-monitor for three days. Also, passengers can now present a negative COVID-19 result from a rapid antigen test instead of a PCR test. Monday's change still leaves Hong Kong far behind much of the world in dropping curbs. International arrivals are barred from restaurants and bars for three days, and they're required to do several PCR tests, one on arrival and on their second, fourth and sixth days in Hong Kong. That's on top of daily antigen rapid tests for their first week. I think the rest of the world has opened up, and so Hong Kong was you know, falling behind, and I think it just needs to open up now and return to normal. At one point, Hong Kong had one of the world's longest quarantine requirements at 21 days of mandatory isolation. In line with China's strict zero COVID-19 policy, Hong Kong has had some of the toughest rules during the pandemic, wreaking havoc on the financial hub's economy. Chenny Wu, NTD News. Two U.S. lawmakers are pushing for a new bill to speed up arms deliveries to Taiwan. The Biden administration just approved its fifth and largest arms sales to the island earlier this month. But an expert that tracks the sales says none of the approved weapons have been delivered. It could take up to five years for Washington to actually deliver the weapons after approving the sale. And the new bill aims to speed up that process. It's a bipartisan measure introduced by Congressman Steve Chabot and Brad Sherman. 
The bill has several goals. The first is to give Taiwan priority delivery of excess defense weapons. The Pentagon sells excess weapons to other countries, but they are ranked in order of urgency, and Taiwan is now behind 30 NATO members. The bill would also call on the Secretary of Defense. That's to use a special fund to pre-purchase weapons Taiwan needs. Lastly, the bill would allow the U.S. to stockpile munitions and weapons in Taiwan. Washington maintains war reserve stockpiles in countries and regions that have U.S. military bases, but Taiwan doesn't host U.S. troops. Vice President Kamala Harris is in Japan this week to pay respects to the country's late leader Shinzo Abe. She met with Japan's Prime Minister on Monday. Here are some highlights. Vice President Kamala Harris is in Japan. She's there to attend the state funeral of Shinzo Abe, one of the most powerful politicians in Japan's history. In a meeting with current Prime Minister Kishida, Harris called the Japan-U.S. alliance the cornerstone of peace in the Indo-Pacific region. And it is something we prioritize because we also believe it is in the best interest of the American people in terms of their security and prosperity, and we do believe the same for the Japanese people. Japan is one of America's most important allies in the region. The two are each other's top trading partners. And under former Prime Minister Abe, Japan forged even closer ties with the U.S. amid rising concerns about Beijing's global ambition. I feel it's my duty to carry on his aspirations and expand on his diplomatic legacy and thereby strengthen and further advance the bilateral relations. Harris is set to spend three nights in Tokyo. On top of paying respects at the state funeral on Tuesday, she's set to meet with Japanese business leaders and leaders from South Korea and Australia. The president of South Korea is voicing concern about threats from North Korea. That's in case of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. In the case of military conflict around Taiwan, there would be increased possibility of North Korean provocation. We must deal with the North Korean threat first. When asked if he means he would ask the U.S. to defend South Korea first before getting involved in Taiwan, Yoon replied he can't reply on Washington's behalf. He also added both issues carry significant importance. A Chinese woman living in New York is calling for the release of her sister, who she says is being illegally detained in China. Police arrested her because she practices a spiritual discipline called Falun Gong. Her sister Lu Na shared her story with us. On the morning of July 11th, Lu Na got a call from family members in China. Her sister had been taken away. When I heard about it, I was so shocked. It was a catastrophe. My sister and brother-in-law are very honest people with good reputations. Lu Na's sister, Lu Wei, was a high school English teacher in Harbin City. She practices the spiritual discipline Falun Gong. Falun Gong is a spiritual meditation practice that teaches the principles of truthfulness, compassion and tolerance. But two decades ago, the communist regime launched a campaign against the practice. Millions have been detained, tortured and killed inside China since then. Na said Wei had been removed from her apartment by a dozen police officers. They had broken into Wei's home in Harbin City. They arrest people without any legal basis. For example, they arrested my sister. If they arrested her, then that should make her a perpetrator. So what crime did she commit? Who was the victim? What was the aftermath of the crime? Nothing. They just picked up the person and said that a crime was committed. In reality, they just arrest whoever they want. As soon as she heard about her sister's arrest, Na began appealing to U.S. officials for help. New York State Senator James Scoofus's office referred her case to Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. And Representative Sean Patrick Maloney's office referred her case to the Office of Religious Freedom in the Department of State. Meanwhile in China, Wei is being held in a detention center in Harbin. No one is allowed to visit her, not even her lawyer. I hope that good, righteous people all over the world will help Falun Gong practitioners in mainland China, as well as those who are persecuted in mainland China, including people of faith, 
like those in Xinjiang and Christians. Na hopes that by sharing her story, more people will learn the truth about Falun Gong and the atrocities committed by the communist regime. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for more than a year. Here's what to look out for in our second half. Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping is seeking his third term this November. If he does keep his power for another five years, what would his authority mean for the party and for Taiwan? The full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer, and see you tomorrow. The 2022 NTD 8th International Chinese Vocal Competition will be held from September 29th to October 2nd at the Merkin Hall of Kaufman Music Center in New York City. The competition is honored to have specially invited vocalists with the world-renowned Shen Yun Performing Arts to serve on its panel of judges. The gold award is $10,000. For more information, please visit vocal.ntdtv.com.